Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Mountain Adventure Film Festival. I'm Benjamin Oberman, and today I'm here with filmmaker Oakley Anderson Moore, who has made the feature film uh, Brave New Wild. Oakley, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have tons of fun. And <laughs> just to start with, um, I understand this is your first feature film. Yeah, it is. Um, I've actually been working on this film since 2008, so it's taken me a long time to make it to my first feature. I ended up making a second film in the meantime that was a shorter companion to this, but yeah, it's the first time I did it. I just um, always knew I wanted to tell this story or delve into this material and just have been learning as I went along. Well, and, and have you always wanted to be a filmmaker? Because this is obviously a very personal story. Um, it is the history of climbing, but it's from your perspective of growing up and your relationship with the mountains and your father. So which came first, the desire to tell this particular story about your own history or to be a filmmaker? And this is what you chose as your first film. Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think that I've been interested in storytelling for a long time. Because I feel like they're just kind of related. And it, like what I like about mountain culture is the storytelling aspect a lot of, you know, you just grow up hearing all these crazy people spinning these tall tales. I mean, some of which are not tall, but just, you know, unusual stories. So I guess just growing up in this environment that really treasured storytelling influenced me from an early age. Mm -hmm. And um, as I got older, I discovered... You know, you always watch films, but then when I got older, I was like, oh, you can make films? Like, someone, you could be a filmmaker? That's a, that's a artistic outlet. I just liked it. I liked the collaboration. I liked that it combined all these elements where humans can communicate with each other through art. And so I definitely decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. And then this, for me, was just a natural place to start because it's a story that I had known pretty well, grown up in, but still been very curious about and wanted to share that with other people and explore that. So... So I guess it was kind of hand in hand. I just knew I wanted to be a filmmaker and I knew that this was going to be the first film I was going to make. Awesome. And, you know, before we talk further about the film, let's talk about climbing. Like, obviously your dad was a very, very avid, passionate climber. Are you? Yeah, I climb. My dad taught me to climb. I, you know, I don't have the, pa I like, I don't live in my van. <laughs> So, and climb full time. Like, it's not the passion the way it was for my father. But, I mean, I'm passionate about the world, and I do like climbing. He taught me to climb. Gosh, I swear, I'm probably, like, a terrible climber in a lot of ways because he was, like, my teacher, you know. So, when he taught me to climb, like, when I asked him to, you know, I was like, oh, I want to try lead climbing, you know. Dad, can you teach me these things? And, you know, he's still climbing on gear that he had from, like, the 80s, and that's, like, kind of what I learned on. So, it was just, like you know, just like nuts and runners from a long time ago. I was like, this is, in retrospect, I'm like very debatable <laughs> the safety of, of using all this stuff that he taught me on, but it did give me a pretty good foundation. So I like being outside and I like, I like climbing. I like the community aspect and I like also just the problem solving aspect. And I like, you know, getting out there and being alone and doing a climb. So that definitely appeals to me. Well, that's good. Um, you know, it's like, you don't always see kids that take to it, but obviously it's like with the story you, you were. So when you, you interviewed some of the great legends of, of the sport, was that, was that exciting for you as a climber or was it more of like being exciting, but also doing your, your due diligence as a filmmaker? I mean, when we showed up to Royal Robin's house, I was terrified. <laughs> I wanted to run away. I you know, almost didn't quite, ha you know, I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I don't, you know, it was terrifying. A lot of it was like, these people were legends in the sport and I had grown up hearing about them. You know, I'd heard about Royal Robbins and Warren Harding and the rivalry that ended up being the chopping bolts on the Donwall. Like I'd grown up hearing these stories. So they had become even larger legends in my mind. And so um, I didn't know everyone when I started, but then I did it's just phenomenal amount of research. Um, I read like every climbing book from 1930 to 1980. And so by the time I got to everyone's house to interview them, you know, I built up in my mind quite an idea about them. So, so for me, it was, you know, 
frightening, terrifying, extremely rewarding because I had built up my own legends. And you also go through this interesting process where you get to meet people and they're real. They're not just a figment of the campfire story. And then you can, through your experience and just thoughtful trying to understand who they really were and, you know, who their life was, you get to have a relationship with them. And that's kind of similar to how you are almost with your own father, your son or daughter. It's like you have a larger than life person that's a figure in your life. But then like, as you get older, you can kind of have similar life experiences. And if you're willing to try to understand where they came from, you look at them in a different way as well. So I kind of felt like that was all part of, yep. part of the, the journey of making the film. Now, did, did you ever ask, because it seemed like uh, Royal, despite all of that uh, competition, uh, did respect Warren for what, what he did. Do you think that if Warren were still alive today, that the two of them would consider each other friends? Or do you think there was still a rivalry even to this day? <laughs> I don't know. It's so hard to tell. It, you, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that they probably would have because just by shared experience alone, they probably would have ultimately, because they did have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. And when I listened to the tapes that I had of Warren Harding, I mean, you, you know, he there was that competition, but they just had immense respect for each other because Warren has a line where he says, you know, Royal Robbins, uh, he made me feel like, I forget what it is, but he was just talking about how intelligent Royal Robbins was. And Royal Robbins is a self-taught man. He's not an academic, but I think the two of them did have a lot of respect. And ultimately, I think that's, you know, I think they would have been friends. Well, maybe a, just a respectful distance, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well and it, I mean, and there was certainly that line, like, where Royal talked about, like, with the Dawnwall, that they got to a certain point where he admitted that he put in a bolt that somehow Warren got through the section without. So. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's what's just so amazing about the story and someone like Roy Robbins is that he can have this strict set of ideals. And then, um, you know, if you, uh, if you, and then if you understand that maybe you've done something that you actually didn't really wholeheartedly believe in, you could actually change your mind. And that takes a lot of courage to do. And yeah, I mean, for me, the film is, is so much about this question of, why people climb, which is like this horrible cliche question that has been asked throughout the ages. And they asked George Mallory about Everest and he said, because it's there. And that's like this refrain that is hilarious over time. But, you know, so there's not the specific answer because it depends so entirely on how you understand, like, I guess the meaning of life. And so that's what the film tries to answer by talking to all these different people and putting together their stories. And Roe Robbins and Warren Harding had this, rivalry because they had different philosophies and uh, about, you know, why they did climb. And it's, just, you know, so, so integral to the film to just, you know, explore that. Great. Well, we do have a few film, a few viewers watching. So I do want to throw out there that if you have any questions for Oakley, please type them in and I'll feed them to her. But um, yeah. when, you, when you made this film, like the film is very much about about Royal, Royal and Warren and all the people around them, which your dad was part of it. When you started out, was this going, did you always know that you wanted it to be kind of a historical film and about those guys in that era? Or did it start out as a path about you growing up and your father and it just kind of led to this bigger story? It kind of, yeah, it was kind of the, the reverse. So I kind of started out going, well, I know the story and I, it's, it's historical, it happens in the past. So therefore I need to treat this like a historical thing. That's kind of how I thought probably should go. Um, and, you know, so many people are doing different things with documentary and there's, you know, the rules are changing all the time. And I thought as the film went along, it became clear that it was important to embrace the personal side of the story because when every person makes a film, the question is always like, well, why you, why were you the best person to make this film? And why did you tell it? And the fact that I had grown up a climber's daughter was just so integral to why I was making the film and give me such a unique point of view on the subject matter that eventually I was like, well, this probably needs to be part of the story. And so I had been looking at our family archives the whole time and I'd been witnessing different patterns in our footage and stuff, but it took a certain point for me to realize that that needed to be in the film to make it the strongest film I could make, which was something that was unique and original and 
showed you this story that was indeed historical, but added an element of personalization and a point of view that you might not expect, my point of view. <laughs> and um, we have a, so Rachel Craig asked, what is your favorite part of the filmmaking process? Ooh. Well, gosh, I hate to say that's po that the editing because the editing was just horrible. You know, I mean, we spent like two years in post-production. But that is where the story really comes together, especially in documentary. You go and you meet people and you're terrified and you interview them and you try to be brave and ask them questions that are important. And then you take that footage back and then you just spend so much time with it. It's almost absurd, <laughs> the process. But I guess that would be it. You know, when you get to the editing process, especially in a documentary, that's really where the story comes together. And uh, some things you thought were going to be in the film end up being dead ends, and you have to move on from that and go find new paths. It's a very like explore exploratory phase, and you know I like that part of it. So I guess I would say that one. But it's also fun when someone actually finally watches your film. <laughs> that's an experience that's also terrifying but extremely rewarding. Assuming well, they like. Yeah, and I, I, I've made you know a number of docs, and I, and I always said like. It was time to go to go into post when when each interview was no longer having those aha moments. So, what did you learn through your interviews that you didn't know, or what that surprised you? Um, you know, obviously, you go in with some idea. Of, you you think you know what you're going to get out of each interview. What what surprised you and took you in a new direction? Yeah. Well, let's see. That's an interesting question because you come in with this idea of like, oh, I know this story and. In 1967, so he'll talk about this, but then maybe it comes out different and they go a different way. Um, but something that also happens is after you have your interview, then you're trying to find footage or photographs or something to like to prove that that's true or to make it a story because you can't just have people talking. And of course, this is from a time period where there's not a lot of footage, so you're just always kind of like you feel like an archaeologist, you're trying to like, uncover something. And so every, and some of that footage has been around, some of it doesn't apply. Sometimes you're using stuff that, you know, you're just giving us a, a symbolic idea of what it was. You know, maybe this isn't exactly the shot from this climb, it's whatever. So, but every once in a while you'll come across an archive or a, some piece of footage, you discover it, and it's something's in there you just could never believe. It just completely like, oh, this is what he was talking about, or this is what she meant. And, um, I mean, for me in the film, uh, so, so, like, some of the interesting things we have are from the 1970 ascent of the Don Wall. There's some interesting footage from the local news crews, and, you know, you're actually getting to see Warren Harding on camera from the point of view of, like, a 1970s cameraman who, who had no idea what climbing was about, and just got helicoptered to the top of El Cap. And that in itself was interesting, and... And a reporter asks, well, why do you climb mountains? And Warren Harding says, because we're insane. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, God, he, I can't believe he said that. You know, I've just been waiting for these things to appear. So that was an aha moment. And another thing in the film is where I look at all my family footage and realize there's a pattern <laughs> where my dad will be you know, zoom in on me, and then I'm just like, Ooh, you know, 1991 or 1989, and then slowly the camera will drift up to, like, some cliff or some interesting rock face, and discovering that was an aha moment that that, you know, existed, just discovering things about yourself while you're in the process. Kind of a long-winded answer, but yeah. No, that's great, and, and with that discovery, did you bring that up to your dad, and did that, you know, change your relationship at all, or to realize that you were always competing with the mountain behind you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's something that you, when you watch the film, uh, which you should, to, to find out, you know, for the definitive answer, although, yeah, I mean, I guess you come at it thinking, thinking one thing, and then you go through a whole gamut of emotions. I didn't show my dad the film until it was all done. But of course, it was, you know, many years in the process, so your relationship just changes naturally. Um, but yeah, I mean, because kind of the, my takeaway in the film is that some part of climbing was this 
was just a personal expression. It's like, I was here, you know, I existed and this is what I did. And it's really hard to share that experience with someone. So I think for me, in a lot of ways, my father's passion and to try to give that passion to me, is just in a way trying to share, you know, what the meaning of his life was and try to share that with me so that I could know that, but then also, you know, go out and explore life and have my own adventures, whether it's rock climbing or not, just do something that was meaningful and fit in with this kind of worldview or life philosophy. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely, absolutely great. Um, now, I, again, I'd like to just throw out there that if anybody watching has questions, please type them in and we'll, Oakley will answer them. Uh, but let's talk about animation because there was a lot of it and it was so well done. Are, are you an animator or like how did, you know, where did you want, did you know you wanted to do that? Did you do the drawings? How did you get the experience? Because animation for film, first film is a big undertaking. Yeah, it definitely took a long, that's the part of why it took so long, every little piece that, you know, prolonged the process. Well, one of the coolest things, so there's, there's a couple different types of animation in the film, but the coolest, one of the coolest things is that we use cartoons from Sheridan Anderson, who was this prolific cartoonist. He also, people might know him for his fly fishing cartoons, but he was also a climber and he did, like, he did cartoons <clears throat> around of, of all the legends of climbing, at least in the Yosemite scene and some in the East Coast as well. So he was just constantly doodling. You know, people were having philosophical conversations in 19, you know, 61 and shared an answer would be doodling and, and he ha and he did these amazing cartoons. And I knew that we wanted to use those because they just kind of embodied the whole spirit of the times, which was this combination of you know, climbing big mountains, but also this like sarcastic, satirical, like what is the point of all this? And um, so I thought if, Sher so, and in, if Sheridan Anderson were alive, I probably would have said, Sheridan, you know, what can we do to convince you to animate these? Because I felt like he would have wanted them to come alive if they were in a film. But he wasn't. Um, we got in touch with his brother, Michael uh, Anderson, and he said, I said, I'd like to animate these myself. And he said, go for it. And so literally, I took his cartoons that he'd done in 1960 through 70, and I did turn them into stop motion. I cut them out. I photocopied them at various sizes. I cut them out. Uh, I did everything like analog. A lot of things in this film are like very analog. So we didn't do it in After Effects. I just literally took the camera, set up a little thing, and then you know, I'd move the arm, for, take a picture, and I'd move the arm back, take a picture, each frame trying to move it. And as I went along, the process got a little better. So you can actually see that in the film, the progression of my skill set. <laughs> Some of our cartoons are, are more engaging than others, you could just as you can see the process happening. So, so that's what we did. We just tried to bring Sheridan's cartoons to life by cutting them out and using his, staying true to his cartoons, but moving them in ways where they became, had that added element. That's great. So is that, do you think that'll be a theme that continues on in your future films? Hmm. I hope so. I really enjoyed it. It was just so amazing how you could take something, bring it, like I liked, I love animation. I love watching animated films. People that are making animated films are so talented and doing so many innovative things. I just love watching people's animated work, so I'd love to keep doing that, but I'll have to get a little better. <laughs> well, good. Well, you know, on the nuts and bolts, like everybody who dreams of making a film, of course, it takes time, it takes resources. Did you do crowdsourcing? I saw in the credits that you got a grant from the BAMP Center, so can you talk about just about how you were able to yeah. uh, pull the other resources to make this film? Yeah, I mean, our biggest source of income was a Kickstarter campaign. So we did a Kickstarter. We got a very small grant from BAMF, but it was like, you know, $1,000, which was gone so many years ago. <laughs> and then we did a Kickstarter campaign. And I think this was, you know, the film's taken so long. It must have been in 20, 2011. I think it was like the December, January of 2010, 2011. Um, and it was sort of like the early days of Kickstarter, I guess. You know, people were already doing it, but, you know, nobody was really. So I, you know. And our Kickstarter backers really made the film happen because we were not able to get funding basically from anywhere else. I think it's hard when you're making it a film that's hard for people to compartmentalize. You know, 
in documentary funding is already limited as it is it's hard if you're not even have an issue film and it's hard if it's you don't have maybe like sponsored athletes i mean it's a challenge um and you know for people to understand why they should put money into it and so i mean we kind of just had to do whatever we had to do which was we did a you know, we did kickstart and we just raised little money, little pieces as we went. And I know that's what a lot of people find that they have to do nowadays is just raise it in little bits as you go along. And so I would tell other people, that's what I did. It took a long time, but it did work for me. So if you want to make a film and you don't have the money, just start and then raise the pieces as you go. And that will influence your creative process sometimes for the better. Well, that's great. And so now that you have a completed film, where is it going and where can people see it beyond this festival? Um, well, after this festival, we have a lot of fun things planned, so definitely check it out if you haven't watched it yet and you have your pass. But beyond this, we just launched our Tug theatrical screening tour, so you can actually come to a theater and watch it with me. Um, so if you go, I mean, we have it on our site at bravenewwild.com. Um, it's just really cool for a small film to be able to get into a theater and get people talking, and the whole point of this film is for people to have a conversation about what things mean to them. So you can see it in theaters. If you go and get your ticket, it's kind of like a Kickstarter for theaters. Like at least like 50 people have to get a ticket to the screening to make it happen. So check it out on, on Tug because we're just, I think our first screening is next month and you can request a screening. So if anyone wants to request one and offer to host one, like I will come out there and help you do that, <laughs> whether you want me to or not. Um, so yeah, so there, and then we'll be having, we'll be launching online, I think in April and you know, uh, we should be on almost like a bunch of different platforms, hopefully, including like our own and my tunes. So, so keep an eye out there, but, but come see it in a theater with us. That would be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, and for everybody watching, uh, through, the, through Monday, we still have the Mountain Adventure Film Festival going at filmfestivalflix.com or mountainandadventurefilm.com. Go there uh, right now. If you use the code 2016MAFF50, it gets you 50% off for the final weekend. Uh, so you can watch the film, vote for it. Uh, if you have a lot of time on your hands, there's 69 other films you can watch as well. And <laughs> then be sure to uh, check in and follow Oakley and Brave New Wild on their Facebook, on their website. And Oakley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been so awesome to talk about the film and all your great questions. And thank you, people watching, and check it out if you haven't yet. All right, everybody. Thank you.